Uh, this talk is called Managing Your Manager, and it's basically a product of the fact that actually as of this year, I've spent basically 30 years in industry in one capacity or another, and if you look at the management literature, anything written for business that's a, uh, directed at managing, you find that the target audience is people who are already managers or want to move up in the ranks or become managers and be more effective at it. There's very little written for people who are technical people who plan to stay that way, don't really intend to wind up on a management track, and yet we have to deal with managers on a regular basis. So these are just things that I have learned over the years, mostly by making my own mistakes. And I'm hoping to give you the benefit of some of that and feel free to disagree with whatever you like in there. Now, um, my contact information again, if anybody wants to reach me, my name is Ken Cousin. It's Cousin like the relative, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, my company's Cousin IT, or as my wife calls it, Cousin It. You know. <laughs> it was her idea. I, had, I could do nothing. At any rate, there's my email address and homepage and blog and a Twitter handle and everything. I've got a few books in the past, uh, Making Job, a Groovy Book, and a, a Great Old Recipes for Android. And I've got a bunch of videos at, at um, Safari Books Online, including, by the way, a much more extensive version of this one, a Managing Your Manager video there now. Uh, also, I have the Modern Java Recipes book, which I talked about in an earlier talk. And none of that has anything to do with what I'm going to talk about now, so let's move on. So a great manager just to give a couple of definitions of a really good one, one thing a great manager does is protects you from distractions. I mean, in a job like we have, you know you need to focus in order to be able to make progress. And in, an, in a business environment, there's distractions all around us all the time. And a great manager will find a way to keep you informed without requiring you to go to a bunch of meetings that you wouldn't have any input in anyway, even though they affected your life. I had a great manager once who was a couple levels above me, and every Monday he'd send around an email to everybody in the division saying, these are the meetings that occurred last week that involve things you may care about, but you didn't have to go to. Like he'd talk about, we hear a rumor of a merger or an acquisition, and this is what we know, or there's a new discussion about a benefits plan that may be on the next option, next time we have to renew, et cetera. Uh, again, these are things that would affect me ultimately, but it would have been a real waste of time for me to have to go to those meetings in general. A great manager will get you the resources you need. Sometimes there's a transition going on in the industry. One of these is happening now in the Java world. A lot of people are moving away from a free IDE, like ones based on Eclipse, toward a commercial quality IDE, for example, uh, IntelliJ IDEA from JetBrains. But that requires a license. A good manager will look at your job and divide by the number of hours you spend in front of this and find a way to make it happen. Others will say, wow, I don't know what to do with the budget, and there'll be all kinds of problems. You know, a great manager finds you resources when you need them, whether they be software or access to a cloud service or the ability to talk to a consultant or things like that whenever you need them. Of course, what we normally think of as great management is somebody who steps in when there are problems. I'm mostly talking here about hierarchical organizations. I'll have a couple comments at the end about a flat organization. But in a hierarchical organization, there are management levels. And if you get into a, not a conflict necessarily, but a disagreement with a manager at a higher level than you are, you're at an inherent disadvantage. And what you need just in order to be heard is an ally. You need someone on your side who is at their equivalent level just to make sure you're in the room when discussions are, are happening and that you're listened to and everything. Because your arguments may be right, but because of the power discrepancy, it may not be enough. You know, you need someone on your side to level the playing field and that sort of thing. But working for a, a great manager is easy. If you have any problems with a great manager, they'll tell you and you'll sit down and talk about it. The question that comes up, though, is why doesn't that ever seem to happen? Why do we so rarely get to deal with great management? And if you think about it, there's a pretty intuitive reason. It comes down to the fact that we're technical people, and therefore the managers we're dealing with are generally on the lowest rung of a management hierarchy, people who have as their career goal to reach the so-called C-level suite, you know, CEO, CIO, CTO, something like that. And they are constantly trying to look for bigger opportunities and newer opportunities as a way to move up. So when you wind up with a really good manager, 
it's not likely to last either, so you really need to appreciate it. Instead, what we tend to wind up with are the people who are the least experienced at management and therefore the least proficient at it as well. And that's really awkward, but it makes sense because the good ones are going to be moving up or moving on. They're always looking for the next major opportunity to go grab it. So if your manager is really not that great, what the heck can we do about it? Well, the first part is to remember that the manager's job is not the same as our job. And therefore, what a manager cares about, the manager's priorities, or as they say in the business world these days, the incentives for a manager can be different than our incentives. Now, there's going to be an overlap. If there's no overlap, why are we working together? But it's entirely possible they're going to be thinking about different things than we are, and that can lead to conflicts. Now, for example, managers are very highly influenced by the issue of money. Now, I'm not talking about salary. I think you'll all agree we're all horribly underpaid, right? <laughs> but that's not the money that a manager's being evaluated on. What a manager's being evaluated on is money for the company. How does this project make money for the company? How is the company affected by you know, growth and, and other opportunities, et cetera? And at the higher you go in the management ranks, the more that becomes a big issue to where that's basically dominant. I have a friend who's retired now, but he used to be a senior vice president at a Fortune 50 company. I mean, this is a big guy. And he used to tell me that if a problem, technical problem, reached his level, then he would have a meeting, he'd be there with all his direct reports and the other people who were affected by this, and the entire discussion was all about what do I need to pay in order to buy my way out of this? Is there gonna be a fine? Do we have to purchase a resource or, or hardware or equipment or whatever? I mean, it was all money, 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 and they'd make their plans. And then once the meeting was over, the technical people would come up to him and say, by the way, do you want to know the actual details of this? And he generally did because the company he was in happened to promote from within and it was an engineering company, so he did have a technical background. But the point was that entire discussion was completely secondary to the money issue. That was key. And this becomes more emphasized the higher you go in management. I remember reading an article about an actor, very well-known actor, I tell you who it was, I just don't remember who it was in the article, who was a director for the first time, had never been a director before. And of course, he was well-known as an actor so that the other actors on the movie uh, knew this guy as an actor and wanted to have actor-type discussions. How do we set up this scene? What's the backstory for this character? How do we build the motivation? All these sorts of things. And he loved having those discussions. I mean, after all, he was an actor. But he admitted in the article that in the back of his mind was this constant refrain, we're losing the light, I've got to get ready for the dailies, I have to go talk to the investors. You know, all these things related to money because he was going to be evaluated on the success of the money issues. And the actors, the other actors were affected by it, but only indirectly. And therefore, the priorities were different. So we have to be aware of the fact that anytime you're talking to a manager at any level, that discussion is at least happening in the back of their mind. Now, you have an agenda you know, for your life, for your career, what you want to accomplish technically, et cetera. Your manager has an agenda as well. We try to operate in the overlap, that's the plan. But we have to understand that these still happen, the times when you are doing something that isn't necessarily what the company wants, and the company's doing something, or more specifically, your manager's doing something that doesn't necessarily fit what you have. It's a professional relationship. It's not, as I'll talk about later, friends or family. And we have to be aware of this so that we can build the right type of relationship with the manager so that you can rely on it when problems occur and still be able to handle it when things seem to go against you that truly aren't personal but generally just professional. And I'm gonna talk about that. Now, let me make some media analogies. Uh, anybody ever see the movie The Cane Mutiny? You have a real treat in front of you if you get an opportunity to see it. It's wonderful, and I'm going to spoil part of it for you. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you who the real villain is, and it doesn't matter. I must have seen it a hundred times. I still watch it every time it comes on. This is a movie made back in the 50s about a, a, a um, U.S. naval ship in World War II known as the USS Kane. Now, by the way, to give you an idea how famous this movie was and the book that it was based on, The Kane Mutiny, you familiar with the actor Michael Kane? 
uh, played a million roles, including Alfred in the Batman movies and stuff, lots of things. Well, that's his stage name. He chose the name Kane based on this movie. That's how well known it is, okay? Now, this movie has in it, as the star in the middle there, Humphrey Bogart. Now, this is not the Humphrey Bogart from, the, from Casablanca. This is not the Humphrey Bogart from the Maltese Falcon, you know, Spade and Archer, always in control, calm, cool, collected. No, no, no. This is Captain Queeg, and Captain Queeg is a disaster. He's insecure. He gets wound up over silly things. He's uh, got all kinds of problems. Now, this is a very experienced crew, a very experienced ship. They're tired. They've been through the mills. And here comes Captain Queeg, and he spouts nonsense all right away. Like they meet, he meets the officers in the ward room and they say, what do we do about some particular issue? And he says, gentlemen, in the Navy, there are four ways to do every problem. The right way, the wrong way, the Navy way, and my way. You do things my way, we'll get along. You could just imagine how well that goes over with an experienced crew. Later, he winds up, uh, the uh, ship is towing targets for target practice. They're finished. They're about to head back to base. And in the middle of turning uh, to head back to base, Quee gets wrapped up criticizing a crewman for having a shirt tail untucked. They cut their own tow line. They lose it. He denies he had anything to do with it, blames faulty equipment, et cetera. So you can imagine he loses the crew. And they turn on him. They make up songs about him. It's a disaster. Well, eventually, they wind up in a typhoon. Okay, a hurricane in the Pacific. And nobody can talk to anybody else. All the ships are isolated. And the ship is in so-called imminent danger of foundering when the executive officer feels obligated to take over, to relieve the captain of command. That's the mutiny part of the Kane mutiny. And of course, they save the ship. They head back. And now there has to be a court martial. And by the way, the uh, US Navy forced the makers of the movie to put a disclaimer right at the beginning of the movie. It says, there has never been a mutiny in the US Navy. <laughs> Just to get them to cooperate, to use ships and things like that, they needed that disclaimer, as if that mattered, but still. At any rate, so then there's a court martial, and the defense attorney, played by Jose Ferrer, does a wonderful job, realizes what the problem is, and he manages to put Quig on the stand. Now, Quig's not on trial here, but he puts him on the stand and puts enough pressure on him that eventually Quig cracks and starts ranting and raving about persecution and the strawberries and everything. And the line officers on the, on the court martial board see this, and they get it, and they say, OK, we get it. We, you're not guilty. We understand. And if you watch it to that point, you think, well, that was fun. It's a few good men back in the 50s or whatever. But the last scene turns it from a good movie into a classic. In the last scene, the officers of the cane are in happy celebration. And here comes the defense attorney, and he's drunk, and he's angry. And he says, look, I torpedoed Quig for you. But he couldn't help himself. He was a sick man. You're real healthy. Do you suppose if you had given Quig the loyalty he needed, the whole issue would have come up during the typhoon? You see, during the typhoon, it's too late to build the relationship. It has to be in place for that to work in order for that to be successful. Now, for us, I don't know what your job is. I'm hoping that it's not something that involves life or death decisions on a regular basis, like uh, in the military at a time of war. But still, for us, what's the typhoon? A merger or acquisition, or just a reorganization inside the company, and you want to be on a particular team or a particular group. Or say something good happens, and we suddenly acquire a new project, and you decide you want to be part of that project. It's too late when that's going on to build the relationship. The relationship already needs to be in place. And it's all based on this loyalty. Now, I picked this word loyalty on, on purpose because management, as with many things, is very difficult to measure. If you've ever had to read resumes, you're going to hire a new developer or something, and you had to read resumes, you know how incredibly difficult it is. Because there's a handful at the bottom, you go, no, 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 that's not going to happen. There's a handful at the top, you say, well, if we can get them, everybody's going to agree on them. And then, then there's this huge mass in the middle of everybody who seems to look good, but how do you know? You know, and sometimes there are external measurements, and sometimes there aren't. Sometimes they have a huge GitHub repository full of open source work, and sometimes they are in companies where that was not an opportunity, or they're a woman or underrepresented minority, and they don't want to maintain a major public presence for obvious reasons. In other words, the presence of that may help, but the absence doesn't necessarily tell you anything. It's really hard. And in management, it's even worse. 
Because how do you know if someone's a successful manager? If you go by the project reports, there never has ever been a failed project. I mean, yeah, we didn't accomplish what we planned, but we learned this, we acquired that, we built up this expertise, we made progress here, we now know what not to do, you know. A lot of things like that, it's really hard. So managers tend to focus on loyalty as a way of building relationships. Now, we all care about loyalty, but managers care about it a lot. Now, I'm exaggerating slightly, but just for effect. Now, you see this, if you're in a company and the company hires a new, relatively high-level person, what's the first thing that person does? They bring in all their own people. Is it because their own people are better than the people on site? In many cases, demonstrably, no. But their own people will be loyal. Their own people will, as they say, have their back. They will stake their success to the manager's success and they'll go together. Now, I'm not saying you want to build a loyalty relationship by just doing what the manager tells you to do. I can't do that. I'm, I'm a high maintenance employee myself, okay? If you tell me to do something, I'm very likely to do the opposite. Normal IT person managing IT people is like herding cats, you know the expression. But there are certain things you can do to be constructive, to build a constructive loyalty relationship so that when the typhoon hits, you have the relationship in place. Your manager, believe it or not, lives in fear. This always comes as a surprise to technical people who are promoted into management. They're not used to this. They have to make decisions in the absence of a lot of good information. There's always a lot of uncertainty. They also know the tech experts are the ones more valued by the company. Hiring tech people is difficult and expensive, whereas if you just want to fire or hire a new project manager, you can find a million resumes of people who say they'll do that. They also generally know that they're not very good at this yet. You know, I'm talking about the bottom rung on a management scale. And now there's this thing that's been going around for the past couple of years called the Dunning-Kruger effect. You might have heard of this. It's a psychological phenomenon identified by two psychologists, Dunning and Kruger, and basically what they say is that some people believe that they're phenomenal at something despite all evidence to the contrary, which is all I'm gonna say about our current political environment in the US right now, so. <laughs> I'll say one more thing, I'm profoundly sorry, okay? Now, moving on, I'm not talking about that. In fact, most of the things I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about, the advice I'm gonna give you, isn't gonna work on highly dysfunctional circumstances. There are a lot of extreme cases out there that are just a disaster, and there's really not gonna be much you can do about it. What I'm hoping to do is to give you some strategies you can use before you escalate, before you say, that's it, I can't stand it anymore, I'm out of here. Things you could do to build the relationship that will at least help. And most managers, especially the ones who are new at it or raw at it, understand they're not really good at it. Now they have to act like they know what they're doing. We all have to do that, right? You always have to act like you know what you're doing in a company, it's just a survival skill. So that seems to be misleading, it seems even worse. The manager's pretending like they know and we know they don't know. But it's just inevitable in many cases. They also know they're the first level to be eliminated, right? I mean, they're not getting rid of the tech people, they're the one producing money, and the top people aren't gonna go. This stuff, as they say, flows downhill. It's the people at the bottom that are gonna be eliminated. And this is hard, and by the way, as managers move up the ranks, the fear only grows. That vice president I was telling you about had to make decisions about closing entire divisions or relocating people, and he hated making decisions like that. They affected thousands of people's lives, and he was never sure he was doing the right thing. A lot of getting, becoming successful as a manager is learning to live with that fear. Now, obviously, we can't do anything about that, although perhaps we can try to avoid making it worse in many cases. Now, one other movie. You ever see Private Benjamin, a Goldie Hawn movie? This one, don't go out of your way, okay? If it comes on, great. It's about half of a good movie. But the idea here, this is from Goldie Hawn's a career when she was transitioning from helpless, hopeless, what she called spacey blonde roles, into the more powerful, mature female executive character she played later in her career. This is a coming of age movie. So it's a comedy, she's helpless at the beginning, through a ridiculous set of circumstances she winds up enlisting in the army. And it's a disaster. And her manager, played by the late Eileen Brennan here, a wonderful role for her by the way, 
recognizes the disaster she is right from the beginning, and the relationship is off to a terrible start. Now, of course, this being a Goldie Hawn coming-of-age movie, there comes a moment when everything bottoms out and she gets an opportunity to leave, and she sees that this may be her only chance to, if you will, grow up, to stand on her own two feet, become a powerful person that she wants to be. She decides to stay, and she turns everything around, and the only person who doesn't really recognize it is her manager. Now, what happens is the squad winds up going on war games, red team versus the blue team, capture the flag kind of thing. And she and her buddies are all on the bounce. So they go up to the captain and say, what's our assignment? And the captain says, oh, you four, you go guard the swamp. The message being, I want you out of my way where you can't do me any difficulties. And if it's unpleasant for you, so much the better. You know, it's that kind of relationship. So this being her movie, they look for the swamp, they get lost. They stumble across the enemy encampment. They take them all by surprise, capture the flag, and now they're headed back to the red team headquarters, coming over the hill, and the captain sees them and radios for permission to surrender because the enemy's coming at her in force. Radios the colonel. The colonel says radios down to Goldie Hawn. Do you accept their surrender? She says, of course not. We're them. The colonel lands and berates the captain. Don't be so quick to give up next time, and then goes to praise Goldie Hawn. Now, this is a B movie at best, okay? But this was the magic moment. All she had to say was, wait, the captain had command. We were on detached duty. She had no idea that was us coming over the hill. She is the one who put us in a position to succeed. She deserves credit too, see? And if you do that, the entire relationship changes on a dime right there. Part of our job is to make our manager look good to his or her manager. Violate this at your peril, by the way, okay? This is key to the constructive loyalty relationship. Say a project goes bad, here comes your boss's boss. Says, oh, I want to interview all the direct reports because I know this is a problem, I've already heard from your manager, I'd like to get feedback from you too. Uh-huh, yeah, criticize the project, the budget, the equipment, the schedule, everything except your manager. Now, I'm not saying the manager wasn't at fault. I'm saying we did X, Y, Z. Then it didn't work. So we had a meeting, and we decided to do the next thing. Because think about this. First of all, your boss is sitting in his office terrified right now. I mean, he knows the project went bad. And here comes his boss talking to his direct reports, and he doesn't know what you're going to say. You're also talking to a higher level manager who knows all about this loyalty stuff. And now he's, he knows your boss. Now he's going to know you, too, see? I'm not saying lie. I'm saying be a team member in this case because it will help the relationship with your boss. And if you don't do that, your boss will know. Maybe not immediately, maybe not directly, but it will impact the relationship. Now, I want to bring up a, a book reference and change gears a little bit. This is a book called The Evolution of Cooperation. And it describes a problem a, a problem from game theory that many of you have sure have heard of, known as the prisoner's dilemma. Now, in the prisoner's dilemma, two prisoners are captured for the same crime, and they're interrogated separately. And if they both cooperate with each other, if neither one tells on the other, they both served a year in this model. If one defects and tells on the other, but the other cooperates, the defector walks, and the person they got told on serves three years, and that's symmetrical. If they both defect, then they each serve two years. Now, this is, the actual numbers aren't that critical, but the inequalities are. And the question is, what do you do in this circumstance? Now, if you're only going to play this once, you defect, because you can't take the risk that you'll cooperate and the other person will defect and then you lose. But if you're going to do the so-called iterated prisoner's dilemma, if you're going to do this over and over and over again, then you have a whole different strategy or a whole range of strategies available to you. What happened was Axelrod had a computer tournament and people submitted programs from all over. Now this is late 70s, early 80s. We're talking Fortran, Basic, COBOL, you know. And all of these programs were submitted and the, the tournament was won by a program known as Tit for Tat, which had a, was written in four lines of basic code. And here's the, here's the algorithm. It cooperates on the first move, and then on every subsequent move, it just echoes what the opponent did on the previous move. 
Very easy to diagnose, very predictable, and enormously successful, as it turns out. Now, Axelrod released all the programs to everybody, said in six months we're going to do this again. I'm going to invite contributions from psychology, from the sociology department, from economics. And they held the tournament again and tit for tat won again, interestingly enough. You can now show mathematically that tit for tat is what they call a stable solution to the iterated prisoner's dilemma problem. And it's really fascinating how what this means is cooperation can emerge naturally as long as both sides remember you're going to do this again and again and again. Now, one of the stories that's told about this is what they call the Christmas truce of 1914. The idea was in World War I, you had trench warfare. It's basically the maximum of defense over offense. You had cavalry charges into mortar fire. Just not going to happen, OK? And what happened, however, every, after everything bogged down into this unbelievably miserable existence in the trenches, on Christmas Day in 1914, all the guns stopped. Soldiers from both sides came out, met in the middle, embraced each other, sang Silent Night for crying out loud. And then they went back to the trenches, and the war resumed the next day. And this happened even though many of them were under strict orders not to do this. It happened anyway. Now, how did this happen? And a lot, of it's, a lot of it started with resupply of food. One side saw the other side being resupplied with food and thought, OK, if we don't fire, they'll see that. And then when we are being resupplied with food, they won't fire at us. And it all grew from that. And there are stories of a new officer at the front being escorted around. And the escort says, you see that building over there? In 20 minutes, it's going to get hit by a mortar. We need to go somewhere else. You know? And the reason this happened is because the soldiers saw the same opponents day after day after day. It's this repeated prisoner's dilemma process that led to the cooperation in the most hostile environment imaginable. So the idea is that this tit-for-tat solution, by the way, it has another name. And it's a phrase that came out of that World War I truce. It was called live and let live. You may have heard that phrase. It all comes out of this same idea. We don't do anything to you. You don't do anything to us. We're fine, see? Tit for tat succeeds because it does favor cooperation. And in the prisoner's dilemma problem, cooperation gets the best reward. It never defects first. It retaliates immediately. Your, your boss does something to you. You don't stew about it for six months getting aggravated. No, no, no. You have to retaliate immediately. But it forgives immediately as well. See, the idea is the retaliation is necessary, but it doesn't have to be symmetrical because the job's not symmetrical. We're not the ones with the power necessarily here. It can be very subtle. The idea is you go into the boss's office if they have one. You shut the door. See, to the outside world, everything is fine. I got your back. But internally, you go, look, I'm not happy here. All right. Now, I have another friend, who, a woman in this case, who worked for the state government in the state that I lived in, in, in Connecticut. All right. She got this great idea on how to save the, the state some money. So she went to her boss and said, I want to change this procedure, and it'll save us all this money. And he said, good idea. And he gave her the budget and the time to do it. And she went and did it, and it worked. So she goes back to him and says, all right, I'd now like to go to the next town council meeting and show everybody how well this worked, and was surprised when he said, oh, I already did that. He took credit for all of her work. Sound familiar? Now, in, in IT, this is even harder for us to stomach, because in most cases, the manager can't do what we do. So when they take credit for it, it's really frustrating. You know, It's really aggravating here. So her immediate emotional reaction is the same one any of us would have had. I'm never giving this idiot a good idea again. The problem is, is that the other stable solution to the prisoner's dilemma problem is defect, 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 defect. And that's what that would lead to. Both sides angry at the other side and never helping each other. And that's really hard to get out of. Okay, So instead, what she did, after thinking about it, is she went into his office. She shut the door. She said, look, I understand that this is your department, that you gave me the budget and the time to do this. But it worked. I should get something, too. And if this guy has a brain in his head, he's like, yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, I got credit from that. And by the way, if you're worried about this taking credit for your underling's work, the higher you go in management, the more normal that is. That's expected, <laughs> seriously, because they figured when you become the manager, it's your turn to take advantage of the underling's work, which is another reason it rubs us wrong, because we're never going to be that manager. You know, so we don't get a turn at that. So that's why it's awkward. 
She went into the office, shut the door, said, I deserve something too. He goes, yeah, you're right. What do you want? You negotiate. You know, It could be time off. It could be a, a reward. It could be money. It turns out for her what she wanted was the freedom to choose the next couple of projects and the budget to do it. And he's like, great, no problem. They did that, let it go. And by the way, at later town council meetings, he brought her along. In other words, the guy did something that helped him and not her, partly out of fear, partly out of selfishness, partly out of stupidity. She called him on it, he fixed it, she let it go. Now, not everybody, every manager is gonna fix it, but at least then you know, because if she hadn't done that, her only answer would have been to leave, see? And I wanna give you something to try that you can do before you escalate, before you have to so, you know, go nuclear or whatever, to say, that's it, I'm out of here. And this gives you a strategy to try out. Now, by the way, if you're interested in this whole prisoner's dilemma thing, I've got a link here to one of the best simulators I've ever seen on the web on this. It's got all these clever JavaScript animations, it's got sliders where you can choose how many points you get for each one or how many are in the population, you can watch the population evolve. It's really a lot of fun. So if you care about the prisoner's dilemma part of this, feel free to take a look at that simulator. Uh, I caution you not to do it in here now because it makes noise, so just warning you. Okay, let me change gears now. Enough horror stories, let's look at some of the good stuff. I read a series of books several years ago about a naval captain called Horatio Hornblower. He hated his name, but these are basically a series of 11 novels written by C.S. Forrester about a naval officer during the Napoleonic Wars. So we're talking roughly 1794 through 1815. He wrote the Captain one, then he wrote a couple sequels, then he wrote some prequels. He basically wrote all these uh, novels over a period of 30 years, you know? And they are a textbook in how to manipulate management, okay? He guides managers, but lets them make the decision. See, you always present your information. We're the tech experts. We get to say whatever we think is valuable and why. Now, of course, they may check what we say. They may check it with other people. So it's got to be correct, or at least reasonable. But we get to influence that decision. But let them have a decision in this, and then everybody gets along. He shows respect for the position, even if not necessarily for the idiot holding the position. He shares credit for successes with everybody, confident that the people who wonder who really did the work will know. And of course, as he moves into management, he eventually looks for opportunities to correct his subordinates' weaknesses. A uh, becalmed ship under Hornblower is very active. Uh, the crew's running drill after drill after drill. The officers are all doing different things than they normally do so that in an emergency, they can help each other out. It's that sort of thing. Now, it's, these are not books for kids, by the way. They really are action adventure with a lot of violence and things like that. But they're very entertaining, and you pick up some management stuff as you go along. Now, I'm gonna bring up this idea of communication preferences, and this is the most controversial part of all of this, because this is gonna lead me to talk about the dreaded Myers-Briggs type indicator, a personality typing system. Now, companies have a love-hate relationship with this thing. Some HR person falls in love with it, makes everybody take a test, and then they use it completely incorrectly by building teams based on types and all of that. The truth is these are preferences, not rules. Anybody can do anything. Operating against type does cause stress over time, but that's not really, you know, don't make decisions based on that. My purpose in talking to you about it is to say if you can diagnose your manager's preferences, you are more likely to structure an argument in a way they're most likely to hear and give you what you want. You make the same argument, you just do things potentially in a different order. Now, because of time considerations, I'm gonna have to kind of zoom through this because I just wanna show you the basics and then the follow-on, which actually did help me in my career. So the four scales are extroversion, introversion, sensing and intuition, thinking and feeling, and judging and perceiving. And as with most psychology things, the words don't mean what they actually sound like. The first one's extroversion and introversion, and it has to do with people, how people acquire energy. An extrovert goes to a conference like this, they're around people all day long, interacting, going and discussing things, and at the end of the day, they're like, where are we going for happy hour, you know? Whereas an introvert's like, I don't know where, but it's gotta be away from all you people, I'm exhausted, okay? People make introverts tired. People make extroverts wired up. They're excited to go and do things. It has nothing to do with how loud or boisterous they are. It's just acquiring energy. Now, interestingly enough, by the way, this is going to turn out to be the least important of the scales, even though it's the most well-known. 
your manager no doubt has an open door policy. Every manager I've ever met had an open door policy. If they have a door, is the physical door open? Is the actual door open? An introvert doesn't want to interact with the outside world unless they have to. They need time to prepare for interpersonal communications. Even a minute or two is enough, generally. An extrovert feels isolated if they shut the door. An extrovert will probably have the door ajar just to feel like they're part of the flow of activity going on around them. So this is a pretty easy one to diagnose. Now again, not everybody's on an extreme here. You'll get people all along this scale. But this is just one aspect of it. Now the sensing versus intuition one has to do with how people acquire information. I mean, I teach training classes on a regular basis. I see this all the time. A sensor acquires information step by step by step. They have a body of knowledge. They add a fact. They add another fact. They add another fact. Then they step back and think, all right, now let's look at this and evaluate. An intuitive, a person who tests high on the intuitive scale, doesn't have the patience for step, 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 unless they already see the big picture. I mean, you have this idea. You go to the conference. You say, wow, I want to use this new technology. You go into your boss's office. Now, if your boss is an extreme sensor, you don't say, let's talk about computer science from Babbage on down. You, know? you don't even talk about, let's talk about the entire world of JavaScript MVC frameworks or anything like that. You say, you know where we are now? Step, step, step. Here's where I want to be. Huh, why? Now you have the big picture discussion. Whereas if your boss is a strong intuitive, you don't go in and say step, step, step. No, no, no. What do you want? Why do you want to do this? Oh, well, here's the big picture. OK, that's interesting. How would we get there? Step, step, step. See, exact same argument, just different order. The worst question, well, first of all, how do you tell whether your manager is a sensor or intuitive? Do they tend to focus on implementation details to great uh, well, detail, you know, great specificity, or do they tend to always go back to the big picture on all of the projects you're working on? The worst question a sensor can ask an intuitive, and I know this, I test high on the intuitive scale, I spent four long years working for an extreme sensor. The worst question a sensor can ask an intuitive is, how did you get that? <laughs> because the worst answer you can give is, the truth, oh, well, I tried what you suggested. That didn't work. But it reminded me of this thing over here. So I mixed that in and tried these couple of options. And that didn't do it either. But it reminded me of this totally unrelated thing, which I put in, and that got me there. That is a completely useless answer to the sensor. The answer you should give is any connected series of steps from where the sensor is to where the intuitive wound up, whether they were taken or not. And once I learned this, my boss would say, how did you get that? And I go, oh, OK, you know where you are? Step, 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 this is where I am. Huh, did you do that? No. <laughs> he didn't care. He's not asking me, how did you get that? He's asking, how does he get that? And once I learned that, my life got so much simpler. Okay? That's what I mean by some of these things have helped me without worrying about a lot of the, the debates around MBTI, around the, the type indicator. Now, the thinking versus feeling measure has to do with how people make decisions. A person with a strong thinking preference values logic and consistency. A person with a feeling preference has an intuitive feel for each part and makes their decisions based on a gut feel. A person with a thinking preference has a scale in their head. And if one side's lower than the other, obviously we do that. Anything else would be irrational, they would say. Whereas a person with a feeling preference is like, yeah, the facts are more this way, but maybe they're not the right facts. Maybe this is going to change tomorrow. Maybe we have incomplete information. They need a gut feel. You have to give them a chance to experience something even virtually in order for them to make a decision. People with feeling preferences often get labeled as indecisive. And it's not that they're indecisive. It's that they don't trust the facts enough to make a decision based on that. They need a chance to see a demo. Something virtual that shows them, and they can go, OK, I feel comfortable with that now. And then they can move on. Okay. Now, the last scale it has to do with when people want to make a decision. If thinking versus feeling is how, judging and perceiving is when they make a decision. A person with a strong judging preference loves to finish things. They hate have a bunch, having a bunch of things open that they haven't completed. Whereas a person with a strong perceiving preference hates finishing anything, loves to start a new project. Does your manager, when a new project comes up, worry about all the unfinished things we have, or do they get excited about the new opportunity? Don't worry, we'll find a budget, we'll find a way, we'll stuff it in somehow. A chance to get it right at last, that sort of thing. 
And again, these don't have to necessarily be extreme, but it's interesting that way. A simple test for yourself, how many browser tabs do you have open at the moment anyway? You know, that's kind of extreme, though. Now, those are the four scales, and they're useful. And if you're interested, go read Wikipedia page. Certainly don't need to spend any money on any of this. You know, Type your spouse, type your, your kids. Be careful with kids, because uh, well, I'll get to that. Uh, they type differently. Now, uh, Wikipedia, as I say, has uh, all this information. But the part that I really used was something called the Kearsey Temperament Sorter, KTS. This is built on top of the MBTI by a psychologist named David Kearsey. And what he did is he said it's these two-letter combinations that become the primary measure of someone's behavior. Then you add a third letter later in life, and then finally the fourth letter. And you notice you don't see any E's or I's in this, because there are extroverts and introverts throughout in all of it. So we have the SJs, the NTs, the NFs, and the SPs. SJs, now by the way, here's the page from Wikipedia on the Kearsey Temperament Sorter. I'm talking about the colored boxes. Again, something that you could go investigate if you're curious. But the SJs are called guardians. They proceed incrementally and they finish what they, what they start. Step, 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 finish, finish, finish. These people are the backbone of hierarchical organizations. They get things done and they don't rock the boat. They tend to move up in the ranks because they get things done. They don't offend anybody. They get labeled as managers, not necessarily as leaders. Eventually, you get to a level where creativity and leadership becomes important. And then it turns out, do they have that ability or not? I mean, it depends on the individual. Okay, But their preference is for SJ. That means they'll move up generally. SJs love checklists. Let me assure you, you cannot argue an SJ out of a checklist, no matter what you do. You can't stop them. But you don't have to do exactly what they say, see? You can just say, all right, let's say if I can satisfy this a different way, and they'll often go with it, OK? Here comes a new report from HR. HR sends around an email and says, I need you to, to, to the manager. It says, send this to all your direct reports. I need. Everybody to read this, fill out the questionnaire, sign it, and send it back in. SJ manager goes, what do I do today to get this done? Send it to everybody, add something to the to-do list, go around, plan a week from now to go harass everybody about it. You, of course, are sitting there in your cubicle. You got all this stuff you have to do right now. Here's the stuff you really need to get to. Down there is the stuff you would like to do. And somewhere below the floor is that form. Right? So your natural reaction is, I don't even want to do this. you know, And I don't know what to put for question four anyway. And six is ambiguous. So you want to put it aside. No, 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 no. Set a timer, OK? 10 minutes, 15 tops. Fill out the form. Put in whatever you want. you know. But here's the key. Submit it, OK? Here comes your boss a week later. Hey, I really need you to fill out that form. Oh, I did it the first day. Now listen to what you just said. You did something that the manager knew you didn't want to do, but you did it because he asked you to do it. Wow, that's constructive loyalty. Really, what'd you put for question four? I left that blank. I didn't know what to put. I don't know if you can do that. Well, do you want me to get it back? No, 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 no. That'd be unchecking a checkbox. Not going to happen, OK? <laughs> Passive aggression for the win, as they say. Here comes the form back from HR. Hey, we need an answer to number four. Fine, set the timer for five minutes this time. Put something in there. This isn't a legal requirement. This is some stupid form from HR, right? <laughs> Submit it again. You will outlast these people, OK? Now, an NT is a rational, intuitive thinkers. They see the big picture, and they have a thinking preference. These are our architects. These people are attracted to the idea of building a system so that everybody can complete this process in an optimized, effective manner. Sound familiar? IT has lots of these people in it, and NTs tend to be attracted to that type of job. The NFs are called idealists. These are the intuitive people with a feeling preference. The NF manager sees this form come in, and they go, who got in trouble? What did they do? Why do we have this form? What am I going to do about this now? You know, that sort of thing. An NF manager is acutely sensitive to interpersonal conflicts on the team and will take steps to deal with it. Whereas an SJ is like, you come in, you do your job, you go home. What's the problem? Now, again, I'm being extreme, but that's the idea. Finally, the SPs are the ones who live in the moment. Jazz musicians tend to be SPs, professional athletes. They're not very common in the business world. They don't like hierarchical structures. 
retail salespeople, especially if they're an extrovert sometimes. But in general, there's not, they're not there. If you can put your manager in one of these categories, you're better able to figure out how to structure your argument so that it's likely to be heard. That's the idea. Now, I want to throw in just a couple pieces here at the end that I go into greater detail in the video and stuff, but I can give you some ideas here. I call these constructive loyalty how-tos. Good enough answers. We all came through a compatible, dysfunctional educational system where if someone asks you a question, they had an answer in mind, and they often wanted to hear it in a certain way. So we learned to give the correct answer in the right way. Well, in the business world, that's not how it works. Someone asks you a question because they're stuck. And this is coming from your manager. They want an answer, and you don't know. Well, actually, this is remarkably easy to fix. The idea is that a good answer today is better than a great answer next week, believe it or not. It's really hard to learn that because we're so used to having to have the right answer. Answer emails, especially from your manager, as soon as you can, with caveats. I don't know, but here's what I do know, here's what I think, here's where I go to find out, and then the magic question, do you want me to look into it? Put the decision on them as to whether to take three days and dig into this thing. I guarantee you nine times out of 10, it's like, no, that's good enough, that's all I needed. <laughs> and you get the reputation of being responsive. You responded. OK, and that's all you really needed in a lot of this. Now, uh, again, answering gives you loyalty. Now, this is one I really want to emphasize as we wind up. The idea is your boss is not your friend. Now, television is terrible in this. Because on television, any community with an office, everybody becomes sympathetic. Everybody works together. They turn into a family with the manager being you know, the parent type figure. And whenever anybody leaves, it's a special episode. It's a big deal. That's not real. That's not the way the world works. If you think your boss is your friend, then the first time he or she makes a decision against you, you'll be surprised and you'll be hurt. I thought you were my friend. No, it's a business relationship. There's another danger here. If you think your boss is your friend, you'll tell them things that you would only tell a friend. Got troubles at home, the kid's acting up, my wife's uh, whatever. You know, you got all kinds of problems. And then when it comes time for them to make a decision about your career, you're asking them to ignore all that. Yeah, good luck with that, OK? It's a professional relationship. I don't know about you, but I need the emotional distance to be OK when these things go against me, OK, like that. So let me just say your boss is not your enemy either. Let me skip along. And all I want to say at the end here, uh, I'm going to skip the special cases, is I'm going to say there is the best possible way to tell your boss that he or she is completely and totally wrong. Okay? I wish I could tell you where I found this. And this is serious. This is just, it sounds funny, but it's true. That turns out not to be the case. Isn't that beautiful? That turns out not to be the case. You could throw in, I could see why you might think that. Try not to roll your eyes. Okay? But that turns out not to be the case. I mean, listen to what you're saying. I heard you. I understood you. I applied it to our circumstances, and it didn't fit. Hey, I can live with that. My wife says it to me all the time. OK? So at any rate, there's your summary. Try not to make your manager look bad. Don't violate the chain of command. Didn't get into that very much. Don't trash your manager on social media. Now, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but the kids today are growing up with social media. We need to learn what not to say there, of course. But don't trash your manager inside the organization either. Try to show responsiveness. People love people who are responsive, even if the answer is, I don't know. Okay? Share credit when you can, confident that the good people know who really did the job. Negotiate privately. Determine your manager's type so you can ask for what you want in a, in a way that is most likely to be heard and understood. And above all, remember, that turns out not to be the case, which you are welcome to say to me if you disagree with all this stuff. Thank you very much for coming.